Thank you for allowing me to be here to talk on the topic of proximal humerus fractures. So over the next 10 minutes, my goal is to answer three questions. Uh, one is to define what a proximal humerus fracture is. Two is to discuss the salient features of a proper clinical assessment, and then we'll touch briefly on treatment. So proximal humerus fracture is any fracture of the humerus that extends proximal to the surgical neck, which is that flare of the metaphysis beneath the tuberosities. It represents roughly half of all fractures that occur to the humerus, and it's much more common in women than it is men, and it's much more common in the elderly than it is the young. There is a bimodal age distribution. Uh, there's a small spike in young patients, typically as a consequence of high energy trauma, usually in the setting of polytrauma situations. But the vast majority of these injuries occur as low energy mechanisms, typically as a ground level fall, and they represent insufficiency fractures, typically associated with osteoporosis. The protective, and, the protective factors and the risk factors you can see on the slide are those that commonly affect bone mineral density and fall risk. There's multiple anatomic landmarks with which one should be familiar with. First and foremost, the anatomic neck is that area of the neck that circumscribes the articular surface, and that's differentiated from the surgical neck, which is in the metaphyseal region, just beneath the two tuberosities, the greater tuberosity and the lesser tuberosity, which serve as attachment sites for the rotator cuff. There's also multiple angles that one should be familiar with. The angle the articular surface makes with the anatomic axis of the humerus is termed the neck shaft angle, and that typically approximates 135 degrees, but can vary patient to patient. And then there's the idea of humeral retroversion, which is the angle the articular surface makes with the trans epicondylar axis of the forearm. The muscular anatomy of the humerus is important, not just because of the normal anatomy, but we, it dictates how these fractures displace. So typically, the greater tuberosity will translate posterior by Carol and others at HSS has shown that it's possible the posterior humeral circumflex may be the predominant blood supply. Unfortunately, uh, this, art this artery remains intact in roughly 85% of fractures. So with that background, what is a proper clinical assessment? Medical school dogma would tell you that you have to know age and hand dominance, mechanism of injury, and various injury characteristics. But as it relates in the proximal humerus, it's much more important to know your patient, not just the injury. So having an understanding of physiologic age as opposed to anatomic age, the presence or absence of cognitive and physical defects or deficits and medical comorbidities, knowing the functional status of the patient prior to the injury as well as their su support structure and their rehab potential is extremely important, and then also having a good understanding of their patient expectations. This will drive treatment much more than age or hand dominance. I'll go back here. Um, so in the setting of a fracture, clinical examination can oftentimes be difficult because patients are guarded and they're painful. It's important to do a good secondary survey to rule out other associated injuries or other uh, associated insufficiency fractures that typically result from ground level falls. And a good neurological examination is important, not just for the peripheral neurovascular, but also for a, to rule out a head injury, particularly in elderly patients who might, may be on blood thinners. Uh, a thorough examination should include a soft tissue assessment, looking for open wounds or deformity. Open wounds, if they're present, will typically be in the axilla. Deformity may give rise or a suspicion for dislocation. And then a neurological examination, like you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, showing uh, an examination of all major motor groups to include three heads of the deltoid. Vascular examination is important. Vascular injury is actually very rare with proximal humerus fractures. Uh, but if there's any suspicion, do not hesitate to get advanced imaging or involve a vascular colleague, and know that these injuries will typically associate with a degree of fracture displacement, age, and the presence of a brachial plexus injury. So those are things to look for to keep a heightened suspicion for vascular injury. Brachial plexus injuries are fairly rare, usually 6 to 7% of the time. Neuropraxias, or stretch injuries to the nerves, are much more common. Even in non-displaced fractures, they can be present up to 60% of the time. And the axillary nerve is typically the most common nerve involved. In terms of radiographs, we typically advocate for two views, orthogonal in nature. So this is a true AP view that you've heard discussed previously, as well as an axillary radiograph. But in the setting of proximal humerus fractures, it's very challenging to get your patient's position for these views. And so a Velpo view has been described uh, with the arm in adduction and internal rotation, which is much easier to obtain in the setting of a proximal humerus fracture. <clears throat> 
Um, here you can see a patient from my practice where the importance of an X-ray view or orthogonal view is important. You can see a posterior fracture dislocation that might have been missed on an AP, which is better characterized by CT scan. For patients in our practice, we uniformly get CT scans if we're planning surgical treatment or if we're trying to decide between surgical and non-surgical treatment. Uh, it also helps with classification. And there's numerous classifications about the proximal humerus. The one that's probably most commonly used is the near classification, which is fairly simple. It divides the humerus into four parts, the articular surface, the two tuberosities, and the shaft. And a part is defined as something that's displaced greater than a centimeter or angulated more than 45 degrees. Despite this cl classification simplicity, the actual intra-observer and inter-observer reliability is actually quite poor, even with advanced imaging such as 3D uh, CT scan. So with that background, how are these treated? Let's, this is actually a case from my practice. So this is a 45-year-old right-hand dominant NICU nurse. She fell while skiing. She has the injury shown in the radiograph on the right-hand side. She has a benign medical history and a neurovascular intact upper extremity. And so questions we hope to answer is, is this urgent or is it emergent? Is it surgical or is it non-surgical? If it's non-surgical, how do we treat it? If it's surgical, what are the options? I'm not gonna focus a lot of time on surgical treatment because there'll be two sessions, one on Friday and one on Saturday that goes over this extensively, but just for thorough or completeness sake, in my practice, percutaneous pinning, open reduction internal fixation, and arthroplasty are the mainstays of treatment. But what about the concept of urgencies versus emergencies? There's relatively few absolute emergencies in the setting of proximus fractures. Open fractures or those associated with vascular injuries would likely represent an emergency, something that should be addressed in 24 hours. Relative emergencies in my practice would include a fracture dislocation with a viable head. So here you can see that the head segment with a large metaphyseal portion indicating that this might be viable. This is something that we typically would like to do within the first 24 to 48 hours. We'd want to do it during daytime hours with our best team and have both um, fixation as well as arthroplasty implants available, which takes time to plan this. If I get a phone call from a referring provider about an injury such as this, we typically advocate that re referring provider start symptomatic treatment with medication, ice, and a sling. If it's appropriate based on their description, we'll also actually ask them to obtain advanced imaging in the form of a CT scan. And then I'm very grateful for our team who coordinates follow-up within one week. And typically we try to treat these with surgical treatment in two weeks. When discussing or deciding between surgical and non-surgical treatment, most intraarticular fractures, uh, uh, the decision about treatment is based on radiographic parameters or fractional classifications, but in the setting of proximal humerus fractures, decision making is more often made on patient characteristics and comorbidities. This is Sir William Osler, uh, one of the forefathers of modern medicine, who is known to say, you have to know what patient the disease has, and you have to know what, pa oh, sorry, you have to know what disease the patient has, and you have to know what patient the disease has. And this couldn't be more true in the setting of proximal humerus fractures, where you have to have a good understanding of patient characteristics as well as fracture characteristics, and this is typically what drives treatment. Non-surgical treatment typically uh, is recommended for stable fracture patterns, elderly and those with medical comorbidities or low demands. And there's very few absolute indications for surgery, which include open fractures, vascular injuries, or fracture characteristics such as head-splitting fractures, fracture dislocations, and significantly displaced tuberosity fractures. If you look at the prevalence of proximal fractures, roughly 60% of them are minimally displaced and have a low risk of complications. And it's been said by some authors that non-surgical treatment is appropriate for upwards of 80% or more of all fractures that occur in the proximal humerus. This is a Cochrane review that compared surgical treatment versus non-surgical treatment. Uh, and they found that surgery did not improve outcomes and was only associated with a higher rate of complications and reoperations. This same group published in JAMA. This is a randomized controlled trial of patients that met surgical indications and they randomized to surgery versus no surgery. They found no difference in outcomes at two years and those findings were, were maintained at five years as well. Now the caveat of these studies is that these, these findings don't apply to these specific features. So displaced two-part tuberosity fractures, high energy injuries, or head splitting fractures and fracture dislocations. So if non-surgical treatment is recommended for the vast majority of these injuries, how do we do it? Historically, in my practice, we would mobilize these patients for a month and be slow to start motion for fear of displacement. But there's been a few studies that have kind of talked about the, the time frame and duration patients should be immobilized. This is a, a study from 2007 that compared early mobilization within 72 hours versus delayed mobilization for stable fracture patterns and found that early mobilization was not only safe, but it's actually more effective. 
This is a more recent study from 2021 that looked at uh, proximal Hirsch fractures irrespective of fracture pattern and found no difference between one week versus three weeks of immobilization. So in our practice, we typically immobilize patients for less than a week. We focus initial treatment on pain control and swelling, and we ask, ask them to begin an aerobic program such as walking to avoid deconditioning. We'll usually involve a therapist to help them with active, assist, active assisted motion and passive motion, progressing to strengthening. You can see our follow-up intervals, and we typically tell patients to expect about a 12 to 18 month functional recovery. So just in conclusion, we'll, we'll uh, discuss what happened to our nurse. So again, she is a young, healthy patient. Her expectations are high. Her functional status and rehab potential is excellent. I characterize this as a comedy four-part fracture based on the single AP radiograph, but her CT scan shows it's actually more likely a comedy displaced three-part fracture because the lesser tuberosity is still attached to the head segment. Uh, we counseled her on the possibility of arthroplasty and use of allograph, but plan for uh, open reduction neutral fixation. You can see her post-operative outcome and her follow-up uh, at 14 months. So in summary, a proximal humerus fracture is one that occurs or extends proximal to the surgical neck of the humerus. You have to know your patient and the fracture and obtain good imaging, and then understand that the vast majority of these fractures are treated non-surgically and that there's relatively few absolute indications for surgery.